All right, can we get a round of applause about my guest? Okay, tell me the restaurants that you're currently operating right now. Okay. Currently, I uh, own a restaurant called Diana, which is in the French Quarter, and has been there for 21 years. And I, last year, I opened a restaurant called Mondo in Lakeview on Harrison Avenue. And uh, in between those two, I was a partner at Herb Saint. Uh, we opened Herb Saint with Donald Lane, Chef Donald Lane, um, in 2000, I think. And I sold my partnership in like 2008. I so two that you're currently operating right now. Two, and I'm a partner in Wildflower Bread still. Okay, tell me a little bit about that. Wildflower Bread is uh, actually lives within Leidenheimer, which is in you know uh, uh, kind of central city, and it's a Leidenheimer is a like 150 year old bakery that does known mostly for the New Orleans style French bread. And when I had Spice Inc., which you were you know, kind enough to uh, <laughs> spend some money at uh, back in the day, um, I, we did bread. And that was the one thing when I closed. I had a, a, a retail, it was actually a kind of a specialty food market with cooking classes, uh, takeout food, a little cafe, a deli, and all this kind of stuff. And um, it, it, it didn't work out. Uh, so I closed it after about two years. But the one thing that I didn't want to give up that we had started doing there was baking more artisan kind of European style bread. And you know, so we kept that and I formed a partnership with Sandy Long Moon Leidenheimer. So Wildflower is a wholesale artisan bakery that sells mostly to ho hotels and restaurants. We don't really eat retail anymore. Where is your, uh, where is that business located? Leidenheimer is at the corner of Simon Boulevard and Martin Luther King. I've seen it. Yeah, it's a big hole, takes up the whole block. It's got the heart on it. It's Leidenheimer. And that's the Bunny Matthews trucks, you know, the Leidenheimer's trucks. So we're, we're, we are, um, we're a separate entity, a separate business, but we, but Wildflower Bread is sold and distributed by the Leidenheimer salesman. So, uh, so basically, three businesses that you're operating on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, and you also do personal appearances and things like that. Cookbooks. I have one cookbook, and I'm kind of thinking about doing another one. Uh, and your cookbook is titled. It's called Crescent City Cuisine, Crescent City Cooking. Um, <laughs> it's a very long title, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, unforgettable recipe from Susan Spicer's New Orleans. That was the publishing company. I was, you know, just going to call it like my cookbook or something. <laughs> but, Crescent City Cooking. Yeah, they, yeah, Crescent City Cooking. They, they, they like to get that you know, New Orleans <laughs> connection in there. So one cookbook. One cookbook. They do. One of the works. Maybe. You're debating if you know and, uh, I'd like to. You know, I'm, just gonna, I'm just starting to think that I had time to do another one. And uh, do you get an opportunity to do many private functions when you curate the food with additions? Do you do that kind of thing? Um, well, we do private functions at the restaurant, but I also do um, a lot of other things. I do mostly charitable events, mm -hmm. mostly, you know, as opposed to just sort of private events for, you know, for profit or whatever. You know, there's, there's, as you know, <laughs> you could spend your every day of the year, you know, doing, doing something. Yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of causes. There's a lot of good causes, a lot of things that need our support. And it's nice to be in the position to be able to go and help and you know, to, to contribute something. So I try to do as much as I can of that. Plus, I got, after being a single uh, career girl uh, with two cats, you know, uh, uh, I got married seven years ago and got a husband, two kids, and a dog, <laughs> all in one day. So my life changed pretty dramatically, um, and so now I'm also, you know, a stepmom. I have two teenage stepchildren, and you know, yeah. yeah, a husband, three cats, a dog, and five chickens. So, <laughs> so I got my hands full. Where are you from originally? Uh, born in Key West, Florida. My father was a naval officer. And I'm one of seven kids, and we were each born in a different town from Key West, Florida, up to Newport, Rhode Island. What number are you in one? I am the sixth of seven. I was the baby girl, 
and then my little brother came along and ruined that for me. So I didn't get to be the baby of the family. My precious little brother. Yeah. And how did you want to do Uh My father was stationed here. We moved here. We moved, uh, when, after I was born in Key West, we moved to Newport, Rhode Island, where my brother was born. Then we lived in the Netherlands for three years, and then we moved here in 1960. So I kind of consider New Orleans my hometown. And how did you become passionate about food? Uh, I love to eat. My mom's a great cook. She's Danish. She grew up in South America. Um, you know, and she was always a wonderful cook and loved to cook and always cooked lots of crazy things for us. So, uh, I, so I started off loving to eat first. You know, we're all good eaters, big eaters in my family. And, uh, yeah, I guess that, uh, I, so right after high school, I kind of thought, well, you know, I like to cook. Maybe I'll, yeah, at the time, this was 1969, there was one culinary school in the country. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent away for a, uh, for a uh, catalog, you know, and showed it to my dad, and he was like, no way, you know, you're not going to. It, back then, it was not the celebrity chef, you know, it was like a blue collar job. He was like, you're going to college, you know, you're going to do something. So did you go to college? I went to UNO for one year. Okay. You alumni. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then I just I got restless, you know, and I wanted to see the world, so I traveled for a few years. And Where did you go? Um, I guess I first went out to San Francisco and lived out there for a while. Then I came back here, and then I went to lived up in Massachusetts. Uh, in the Amherst area, where I was like the only non-student area, you know, in the whole. I'm from here. It's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful area. I really. In fact, I'm going back to uh, do something at UMass next next March. My sister lived up there. She married a her, her. My sister married her psychology professor when she went to UNO, and uh, <laughs> and they um, they ended up moving. He was he, he taught at UMass, and so I went up there when summer to visit her and ended up staying for about a year and hanging out in that area. It's really nice. They call the five college area because we've got the, uh, Mount Holyoke and uh, UMass and, and, and uh, yeah, Hampshire College and Amherst College. And anyway, it's a cool area because it was very rural, but they also had a lot of cultural stuff going on, you know, so it was beautiful and, and I lived on a farm, you know, Goats and stuff like that, but there was always concerts and you know cool stuff going on through the colleges. And so, uh, what other places did you? Do? Um, well, I came back to New Orleans, and then I ended up going to Europe for you know a few months, just kind of cruising around. And you know, I just kept sort of coming back, and I'd work for a while and save my money and travel and come back. And so it was about ten years uh, after I left high school that um, I started cooking here in New Orleans with a girlfriend. And, uh, and she she sort of drew me in. We cooked socially together, and then she. Uh, Explain what you mean. You cook socially. Uh, meaning that you know, I met uh, her boyfriend and my boyfriend were friends, and we got to be friends. And, and you know, I think I was just working a you know, some kind of job where you actually only work forty hours. You know, it's like back in those days <laughs> where people like work forty <laughs> hours. And uh, so you had time after work to kind of hang out and cook dinner and socialize and you know do fun stuff. So we started off just, yeah, we both enjoyed cooking, so we would do dinners. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know that's a good thing to do. Okay. So, but anyway, so she started she started getting into it on a more professional basis, and then when she did, she sort of drew me into it. So what was your first professional gig cooking? My first actual professional gig cooking was at a restaurant where she got her first chef position. And it was a lunch restaurant uh, down on, in the 300 block of St. Charles Avenue. What was this? This was in 1978, I believe. And she got a chef gig? Yeah, it was a lunch. It was a, because she had gone to culinary school she in France and okay. stuff like that. And so she So she cooked socially, but she was a trained Well she after we cooked together socially she decided she wanted to, to pursue it. So she went to school. Mother, so she did. And while she was doing it, you still kinda of doing a social cooking thing? Yeah, we were just, you know, hanging out or I was
was, you know, I was working for a printing company doing, you know, kind of mechanical art and stuff like that. And I, she went to school in France for a while. And then when she came back, um, we did some catering. You know, I helped her as an assistant with her catering and cooking classes and things like that. And then when she got this position, she said, come, you know, come work in the kitchen with me. I remember she said, I can get you seven dollars an hour. And I was like, whoa! <laughs> seven dollars an hour, man. All right, I'm there. Because I was like, you know, I was making like five fifty or something at the uh, at the printing company. Where I was <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. But in seven eighty, they did Well, with both the ones. Okay, so. Um, you're now making seven dollars an hour, and what are you doing in the kitchen? Um, basically being her assistant. You know, we're cooking and everything. How exotic was it? Was it a very exotic experience? Um, no, because she had given you know she uh, she taught me really well just when we were you know she had already given me a really good foundation just in terms of technique and, and stuff like that. And I mean, it was interesting. It was just uh, we had a manager that you know, kept wanting us to do some of his dishes and stuff, and we didn't think they were very good. So in, anyway, it, it was pretty short-lived. I worked there for about three months, and then we closed for, for uh, vacation, 4th of July. And basically, he, you know, we were both fired from that job. It's the only job I've ever been fired from. Okay. Ever. So. <laughs> We'll rush around that, we'll never do it. It doesn't get, it's not <laughs> open anymore. Oh, okay. It's not open anymore. Uh, right. yeah. so. It was called Gertens at the time, and he said, you know, he fired us and he said we had bad attitude. <laughs> so, and uh, I remember, you know, I tried to be very dignified, and I said, I think you're making a mistake. And I just, well, you know, I just left. And then I went and worked at the, uh, for a French chef down in the French Quarter. Okay, so I had met when I was so at this point, a waitress. Now you decided that you were going to well, I, you know, I, was, I, mean, I was very interested in it. You okay. know, it definitely seemed like you know, uh, and and she had worked with this chef, and I had worked with him when I was a cocktail waitress at this place. It was the Marie Antoinette Hotel, mm -hmm. and there was a a, um, a bar called Le Directoire. And I had been a cocktail waitress there when I was about 19. Okay. Um, when I was very like young and naive, <laughs> not very good cocktail waitress. I was never a very good waitress. So I had met Danielle because he had just come over. Danielle Bono was the chef, and he had just come over from France, and he didn't speak very much uh, English, and I spoke a little French. Um, and I would go punch the time clock in through the kitchen, so he would always, you know, kind of talk to me, and I could speak, you know, speak a little bit of French. So. So this was about seven years later I came back and um, she talked him into hiring both of us for the summer. Okay. Um, you know, and he agreed to hire me and everything. Then he went off on vacation. And the day that he came back from vacation, she quit. My friend quit. And, and you know, she ended up marrying a rich lawyer and never cooking professionally again. <laughs> and, and I, uh, you know, I stuck with it. I didn't know how to do anything else. Wow. And uh, yeah, after I, so I worked, and he kind of ignored me for the first couple of weeks when he got back. But then I started asking a lot of questions and, you know, bugging him and reading the books in his office and asking him things. And eventually he became a mentor to me. He, you know, he started talking to me and showing me stuff and, you know, pushing me to do things. And he actually is, you know, a great friend and definitely my, my first mentor. Wow. Uh, how long did you stay under his team? Well, I worked, that was 1979, and that was at a restaurant called the Louis XVI down in the quarter. And um, I worked there for about three years, and then one summer, um, he, there was something that came up, and it was an opportunity, somebody had invited him to come to cook at a hotel in Paris, and uh, he couldn't do it, he had a prior engagement, and I said, well, send me. You know, I'll go. I'll go do it. And, you know, <laughs> I'm like nervy, I guess. And uh, so he said, okay. So I went over there, and it was actually with the members of Beau Soleil. You know, because they were having this uh, this hotel, the Sofitel Hotel, was having a, a Louisiana week, a promotion, and so they decided. But it was kind of odd because they wrote the menu that they <laughs> wanted us 
to cook, and then rather than it being like a real Louisiana menu, it was an old, like, Creole menu. So it had all kinds of weird stuff on it, like beef tongue with capers and, you know, things that I hadn't cooked before, but they were more like French Creole dishes than, like, you know, New Orleans Cajuns or anything like that. So I was like, well, I can do it, you know. So I went over there, and I worked for, it was about a 10-day promotion, and while I was there cooking in the kitchen, there were two restaurants. One was the real fine dining restaurant. One was kind of more the sort of brasserie, kind of more casual uh, restaurant where the promotion was. But it all operated out of the same kitchen. So that 10 days that I was there, I was, you know, right in the middle of where the fine dining stuff was happening. And I was meeting all the cooks and talking to them and watching what they were doing. And, you know, at the end of the time that I was doing it, um, you know, I, I got to be kind of friendly with a couple of the guys. And I was like, well, do you think the chef would let me come back and work here sometime? And he was like, yeah, you got to ask him. And so one of them kind of, I think, paved the way for me a little bit. And he said, well, you can come back and, you know, in the fall. So um, I went back and talked to Danielle, my, my chef. And at that time he said, well, in the fall, we're gonna open this other restaurant. We want you to be the chef at this other restaurant. So I was like, well, you're crazy. You know, I'm not ready to be chef. <laughs> I've been cooking for three years. And I was like, there's no way, you know, I'm not gonna do that. I got, you know, I can't be a chef. I gotta, you know, I said, I need to go and kind of see what, you know, what I know. I compare what I know and kind of see where I am and mm -hmm. learn some more stuff. Well, so that was back in the day before, um, uh, you know, email or even faxes. It was like LX. So <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm really good. So I sent a telex, you know, said like, I really want to come over for the summer. Kind of work in the summer and they telex back, you know, and, uh, the summer's kind of slow. We don't really, you know, need any extra people. So this went back and forth a little while. You know, they said, come in the fall. Like, I can't come in the fall. So finally I, uh, I packed up my apartment and said, I'm you know, packed my bags and I said, I'm going to Paris. And we let them, he dropped me off the airport and I said, would you send them a telex to say I'm coming? So I showed up at the hotel with my bag in my hand and he was like, okay, you're in the room. You know, so he laughed, you know, the chef. So I just said, I'm that here. That was a critical decision. I'm here, yeah, it was, it was. And I can't imagine myself doing something like that now. <laughs> I'm young and dumb, you know, they say. What was that when you when you look back on it? When you think that that was the right decision? Yes. A lot of people don't make that kind of decision. Yeah, yeah, and and it is a, it surprises me when I think back about it because I you know it took a lot of it took a lot of nerve to do it and I'm you know, kind of surprised that I had. Uh, but know, but I think I was so fired up about learning to cook. I finally I think what it was is that I was like you know what I've been doing it at that point for a, a couple of years and I was like, you know, I finally found something, you know, my metier. I finally found my thing that I could be good at. You know, I'd looked around, I'd like bummed around doing different things for 10 years after school and I kept thinking, you know, you gotta be good at something. You gotta find something. I wanted it to be something creative. You know, I had no musical talent. I had no, you know, I always loved music, but it just, you know, I, I didn't have any pull in that direction or any, any you know, ability. And so you know, I was so grateful when I found something that was creative and uh, challenging and, and that it felt, you know, it was a medium that was very comfortable for me. You know, I guess having helped my mother cook all my life and, you know, just being familiar with a lot of different kinds of things and you know, it just it just felt great. It felt great. I loved the physical aspect of it. I loved the you know the mental challenge. I like the immediate gratification of seeing a plate come back empty. You know, uh, there's so many things I like about it, and it's also very social, and I like that too. You know. How long did you do the France thing? Um, for a summer, I was there for three months. I lived in a little room. They had these. They had a floor where they had. A, there's a thing called doing a stage. It's felt like stage, and if you're a stagiaire, you know, you're there, and it can be anywhere you kind of create your own uh, stage, where it can be you can come for three days and take notes, or you could come for longer. But it's a, basically a non-paid 
position. They gave me a, a like a little sort of a pittance, you know, and, and then I had room and board at the hotel. So, which was nice because I mean I really didn't know what I was. Gonna, I don't know what I would have done if they had said, you know, get out of here. So what did you learn? <laughs> um, I what I learned was that I was pretty much at the level that I felt like I was. Over in France, it's much more um, almost like a military rank ranking. You know, uh, the positions in the kitchen are like you know, private sergeant, whatever. You know, um, and so you so. Where I thought I was in terms of my skill level and everything was was pretty much you know like about a sous chef level. What are the what are the generally speaking what are the positions in the kitchen? Um, oh, in in any kitchen. Well, it, over there it's like you have something called um, okay, a commis, with, which is pretty much the lowest. You know, just a kid that comes in. Um, what do you do? Uh, you know, they might just peel stuff. Just they do the, the lowest level, most basic, you know, peel vegetables and you know, other really chopped parsley and you know, all the minor stuff like that. Um, uh, and then you have the um, the kami, You have uh, uh, there's another level. Then there's chef de partie. Is kind of like the chef of one part of the kitchen. So like the garde manger, which is the cold part of the kitchen, you know, does the salads and the cold appetizers and things like that, or the saucier, or the, um, you know, that's what they have to the top of the, you know, the grill guy. Yeah. And all those equal. The chef de parties are all pretty equal. <coughs> then, you have, then you have the sous chef, and then you have the chef. What's the difference between a sous chef and a chef? The sous chef is like vice president. Essentially, you know, he's the person that runs the kitchen when the chef's not available, not there. Uh, he's kind of the liaison between, you know, the lower ranks and the chef. You know, the chef de cuisine. Sometimes there's a chef de cuisine and an executive chef. And chef de cuisine would be above a sous chef. It, it would usually be in a larger establishment, you know, or a place that has like a couple of different um, restaurants. Something. And so you knew you were at the sous chef level. Yeah, I felt like I was at a sous chef level at that point. And that gave me, you know, that gave me some confidence going over there and kind of, you know, feeling like I, you know, I, I felt this, you know, respect. I was the only woman in the kitchen and I was a, quite a novelty at that time. There were people that would walk through the kitchen and point at me and like say, regard la petite cuisinière. You know, look at the little girl cook, you know, and stuff like that. And they would all be going like, you know, pas trop fatigué, Susan? You know, do, do I want to sit down? Are you not too tired? You know, and I was like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm okay. You know, but it took a while. I had to, you know, work for, you know, side by side. Because everybody would go in and um, you you'd go in and you work the lunch service. You know, you get ready for lunch, work lunch service. And then you would take a break in the afternoon and then come back and work. You know, prep for dinner and work dinner service five days a week. So, you know, it's a pretty long day, but it, I was already used to that. You know? And so that, you know, eventually the, most of the kitchen was was really open. To, you know, sharing their notes, their notebook, showing me stuff, talking to me. You know, we socialized together. And um, yeah, there were one or two guys that were, you know, not that nice. not that nice or not that happy. But it really wasn't a bad thing. Nobody was, you know, rude or, uh, well, maybe a couple of times, <laughs> you know, but it wasn't, it was not the majority, so I felt pretty comfortable, and, you know, and it gave me, it was a real confidence booster, it gave me a lot of confidence. So you got done with that, what did you do next? Well, the other thing that was kind of cool about it was, it was right in, in the early 80s, it was the beginning of what they called Nouvelle Cuisine. So what I had learned at the kitchen where I was at, at the Louis XVI, which was a classical French restaurant, where everything there was not very much stuff that actually went out on plates. At, at Louis XVI, it was kind of the old style service where everything went out on kind of on platters, and, and the waiters really finished things on the garadons, on you know in the dining room there was cooking on the, and they plated stuff that we prepared, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, at, at the uh, Relais de Sèvres, which is where I was in Paris, it started to be, it was the whole new thing of the 
presentation, you know, the plates and the decorative plates and, you know, all the little touches and the, you know, herbs and sauces and things like that. So that was fun, you know, it was really fun seeing it. And it wasn't like, the chef that I worked for was a, a really good chef. I mean, it wasn't like a lot of really silly stuff. It was, you know, it was really uh, delicious food and it was, you know, it was, it was beautiful and it was, you know, artful, but it was not like crazy. You know? So when you left France, you came back and you worked on the meat there? I came back and I took the chef position at, at a restaurant that, that we opened called Savoir Fair. And that was up on St. Charles in Jackson. And that was 1982. We opened in the fall of 1982. And that was tough because um, I had to hire a staff and put together a staff. And my chef, Danielle, you know, I mean, he consulted with me, helped me, but he made me do everything myself. And the scary thing was that every resume I looked at was like longer than mine. I'd only been cooking for three years and I was trying to hire cooks and sous chefs and things that, you know, had gone to culinary school or done this or done that or worked all these different places and uh, you know so I was like oh my god you know, this person does more than I do and you know so I was I, even though I had gotten my confidence boosted then starting this whole process kind of like took it back down again I was like what am I doing why do I think I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have to tell these people what to do and so you know, I created the menu and and uh, well, you know, at first it was really hard. It was really, really hard because I had people come and, and, you know, I mean, I had a whole kitchen full of people saying, okay, what do we do now? What do I do now? <laughs> you know, how do we, you know, we're opening a restaurant. I've never opened a restaurant before and, and you know, um, I had to, you know, had all the, res had the menu, had all the recipes and had to tell each person how to do everything. And, yeah, I'd go in my office and cry a lot. <laughs> kind of prior <laughs> anyway but uh oh god I most of these people would come up and like say you know I'd give them a task that I thought would keep them busy for like an hour and they'd be back in 10 minutes going like okay what do I do now I'm like go away I hate you like, <laughs> <laughs> just thinking that to myself like oh yeah it was hard it was hard you know I, I wasn't used to being the boss so uh, eventually, yeah, we got up, we got running, and then I, um, and that's when I, after we were going for a while, that's when I kind of realized what, uh, kind of what separates the, the chefs from the cooks. And what, and what I think it is, is, is having a, a certain standard of excellence and, um, you know, to be unwilling to accept less than that, you know, to, to, to know what you're aiming at and to set that standard for for other people, you know, and to get them to motivate them to <laughs> want to do that, you know, consistently. Give me an example. Um, you know, just just the quality of the food, you know, just to make sure the food is, you know, it's cooked right, that it's hot, that it tastes good, that it, you know, looks good, that it's. I mean, it's, it's what I do every day. So would you, you say know? that it may be uh, the cooks? Because they only do it one part, they may not be as concerned about the transition to the next part, or because they're doing such a mundane part over and over and over again. It, is it all that that makes it challenging? I think that you just have people, no matter what the sort of career or what the, you know, um, that are, you know, I think you have people that, for whom the choice is a career, for whom the choice is just a job, you know those people that are really excited about what they're doing or those people that just want to come in and kind of maintain the status quo or people that no matter what the job is, whether, you know, you know, there's, there's, I mean, I always kind of believe that any job worth doing is worth doing well. I mean, it's very, you know, I'm just kind of that way. I'm just, I've always been sort of a doobie, you know, <laughs> since I was a little kid. Yeah, I think maybe my dad, I don't know, you know, just this, uh, I, I just believe that, you know, you get out of something that you put into it, that you, you know, that part of the reward of any job is, is you know, the pride of, of, of doing your best and, and a job well done at the end of the day. So, you know, I just, I, that's what I, I look for, but also, you know, so I mean, I think that that's in anything. 
And, you know, there are just people that, you know, there's people that really, really want to cook and they try really hard, but they just don't have the aptitude for it. You know, they don't have kind of that, you know, there's just something in there. And then there's other people that, you know, that are gifted but don't really want to work that hard. And, you know, there's all levels. There's all levels of people in the kitchen. And you got to kind of find a way to, you know, I like that. I mean, that's one of the challenges of being a manager in any kind of situation is you have to find whatever it is to motivate people, you know, to, to do what you're trying to get them to do. And, you know, or if there's people that, that really want to do it, to give them the tools. You know, first you have to give people the tools to achieve what they want to achieve or what you want them to achieve. And then you have to kind of, you know, prod them a little bit. Or right. show them or, you know, whatever whatever works. The two is primarily in a, in a restaurant or for someone to succeed. Are they different, um, different positions or is it mainly? Well, I mean, showing somebody, showing first of all, you know, first of all, you know, I mean, well, there are, there are literally tools, you know, your knives. So, you know, showing them what tools to use for the job and how to maintain those tools and, and take care of them. And then, you know, teaching technique, you know, and actually, you know, product identification, you know, show, like showing people what stuff is, you know. You're saying things. training, basically. Yeah, training. Big part is training. Uh, teaching, teaching, always teaching. You know, that's, that's a huge part of a chef job. So every chef's great teacher. I think some of them are. I think I think most of them probably are. Uh, I mean, you know, are they are they natural? You know, necessarily great teachers? No, you know, not every. I mean, some people are more patient than other. Everybody's got their own style. Um, you know, I think I'm more patient now than I was. You know, <laughs> so instead of being less patient as you get older, you know, sometimes think you're more patient than uh, can be. The period of time you were at this restaurant was for the years. From 82 till about 85. 85. Now the chef thing hadn't taken off at this point. No. So being a chef was like what back then? I mean, you know, what was it? Oh, you know, it was, it was, it was hard work, but it was fun. You Meaning know? you'd be driving in the cars and this is it, what do you do? It's how a chef, the reaction is. Uh, well, that's cool, you know, I mean, it was, I think, you know, also because I was a woman, I think people thought it was kind of intriguing and interesting, you know, and kind of different, and I, and, you know, for me, it worked more to my advantage than against me, you know, because people thought, oh, well, that's cool, you know, so, I mean, I started getting some attention early on, and 80, about 80, 80 well, I guess in the late 70s, early 80s is when Paul Prudhomme started coming up, up in Cape Halls, and, you know, started, started, you know, he was one of the first ones to kind of achieve that, that whole celebrity, you know, chef thing, and, and so, you know, that was kind of starting to happen a little bit. There were some big, you know, Paul Lecousse in France, and, you know, it was just really the, the 80s, I think, or when it started to happen. It really didn't explode until the 90s, but, um, but you know, so being you know being a woman was good, and I'm never. I don't think anybody in my family, my dad certainly never, you know, he didn't want me to be a cook because he thought I could be something, you know, much different. You know, he thought I could be more of an academic or something. You know, but I mean, he always had very high expectations of all of us, you know, in the family. You know, I, I never felt like being a woman was a handicap in any way. You know, I never felt like, well, you can do this, or you, but you can't do that, or, you know. What happened, what happened after 85? Uh, I ran away again. <laughs> um, at that time, uh, my chef mentor left to open up the Eiffel Tower restaurant on St. Charles <laughs> Avenue. And, uh, and that's when, and because, uh, you know, the whole black and red fish and Cajun thing was exploding. The owner of the hotel and the company that I worked for wanted us to start doing less French and more kind of Cajun stuff. So I was like, eh, you know, I think I'll hit the road. So I took off, went back to California. I thought about maybe working out there for a while. And then I went back to Europe. Because actually I cooked at the Jazz Fest in uh, Nice for four years. Uh, to, as assistant to Buster Holmes. Mm -hmm. 
So that was, uh, and you know, George and Joyce Ween um, did the did the festival over there, and they actually decided to bring chefs, uh, you know, cooks from New Orleans to cook for the musicians because all the uh, New Orleans musicians were complaining about how they couldn't get a good meal in France. <laughs> so they had to import New Orleans cooks over to cook for. <laughs> <laughs> so you did that? So I did that, and that was really, you know, so that was kind of a fun thing to do. I did that, I started that in like 1982, and I did that like three years, and then I came back and did it again, I think, I guess it was about 86, and I went back and, and worked with Buster again, and, um, and cooked over there, and then traveled around Europe a little bit, and, you know, worked a little here and there, um, and then I came back to New Orleans, and that was after the World's Fair and all that stuff. I worked at the Meridian Hotel for a while mm -hmm. um, as a cook. Um, and uh, they had a, a French chef who was sort of the... Oh, you worked in Henri? Henri, yeah. Nice. Well, now I have a cook now. Was I? Oh. In JW. No, oh, no, okay. Was okay. That's where it was. Mm -hmm. That's cool. It was a beautiful room. I don't, I'm sure they changed it a lot, but... I think we did some good things with it. I'm sure, I'm sure, no doubt. Um, but anyway, it was a cool place to work, except that it was it was weird because it was very removed from the kitchen. So it's like I never even saw the plates come back. Or it was very different, you know, just being a cook and not, you know, I didn't do any, you know, we didn't do our own purchasing. You know, you had to do a requisition food from, you know, somebody who didn't know anything about it up on the, you know. 10th floor or something right. like that. It was just, you know, it was a little strange. But I did it for a while. It was good. I learned a different kind of food. It was Alsatian in France. You know, they had a, a, a chef who was a consultant from there, from a wonderful, you know, three-star Michelin restaurant there. So it was a good experience for me to learn. And then uh, while I was working there, somebody contacted me and said they had bought the um, uh, the Maison de Ville Hotel on, on Toulouse Street. And, that they had bought the property next door, which had been a bar for a long time, and they wanted to open a restaurant there and take them on the show position. So I went and um, cooked for them and, and interviewed them and got that job. So that was kind of fun. So I opened a little 40 seat restaurant there right on Toulouse between uh, Bourbon and Royal. It was called Bistro at Maison de Ville. And a uh, tiny, tiny little kitchen. I remember the night we opened, I had all my salad stuff in ice chests. You know? <laughs> it's great. Like, uh, yeah, we had one refrigerator like out in the alley. You know, the, uh, oh my God. Outside? What's that? Outside? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was like, you know, my. Uh, it was very, very small kitchen and it was open. So anybody walk into the bathroom. You know, walk past the kitchen. <laughs> it was like a galley on a ship. It was like one little small line on the other side of the, you know, the dishwasher and everything. But I met a lot of people and you know had a good had a good uh, a good time for uh, four years. I guess I worked there. And so now we're into the nineties. Yeah, now we're into uh, nineteen ninety. Yeah, so when I met nice. my um, well, there were some customers. People were always complaining about the restaurant because it was forty seats really 40 seats and so it was hard to get reservations and that used to really make people mad all the time and uh, so I had, would have customers several different customers that would say like oh if you ever want to do a bigger place let me know so I, I looked around I, there was this one couple that I liked and uh, so I looked around you know to try to find another spot and looked at a few places and nothing really felt quite right and uh, so I kind of gave up for a while and then Another one of my customers said, um, you know, a few months later, he said, you know, I got a spot for you. And um, I was the spot where Bayona is now. And I went and looked, and it was, had been a restaurant called the Maison Pierre um, that I used to walk past on my way to the Louis Sixteenth. You know, when I had my first job, I used to walk, and it was like this cool, you know, fancy restaurant. And the waiter for all in tuxedo and kind of peek in and see what was going on. Um, uh, they had closed and they had sold the restaurant to uh, the LaRue family. It was a restaurant family on the West Bank, Warren LaRue mm -hmm. uh, had LaRue's and his two sons were chefs. And they, he had bought the restaurant for his two sons and then one of them, they opened and then one died in an accident. Mm -hmm. And they closed right away and then the 
guy that told me about the place who bought it. He bought it like, you know, livestock and barrel. So, um, so I went and looked at it, and it was everything you know, that I thought a restaurant in New Orleans should be. You know, first of all, I had a courtyard, and I was like, if I ever have a restaurant in New Orleans, it has to have a courtyard. You know, I love just from my time in Europe and stuff. I love eating outside. And, just is so, you know, and I think that's what's so special about New Orleans, too, the little hidden, you know, the, you know, the hidden gardens and the, the whole thing. So I was always like, gotta have a courtyard. And, um, and it had been a residence originally. It was a two, 200 year old building and, you know, it had originally been built as a residence. So it was divided into like three rooms. So it was a lot of seats, you know, which meant you could make, you know, you could financially, you could, um, you know, make pretty good money. and. Uh, but it was divided in such a way that it felt intimate, you know, and, and really nice. So I told the people about it, and they came and looked. And three months later, we opened a restaurant. So how long have you had it now? It'll be it'll be 22 years <coughs> in April. Or eight or two months ago. Okay. I can never figure out how to get it. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, the doors. Oh, the door. Like, yeah, so down the little yeah. You know, got so many windows. As well, it used to be open kind of closer to the street, but it's just so pretty to walk down that carriageway. They used to have a big old, this big old yellow, like, I don't know, 1920s car. It wasn't a, it wasn't a Rolls Royce, but it was something like that. We used to have that park in the carriageway. Wouldn't it be so cool if I could just take all the stupid there just to try a restaurant out? Yeah, it would be. <laughs> 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 it can literally only fit us. <laughs> no, no, we see. We, we see the hundred in the main dining Does it? room. Yeah, it's, it feels it feels very intimate. I can see actually. We see thirty outside, and we also have a small private dining room upstairs that seats another thirty. Something. I've never been upstairs. I've got no. VIP. Yeah, I mean, oh. <laughs> no, I like the downstairs actually. You know, I'm not sure with the. You're good, Sil. Downstairs is great. It is. It's, it's, it's the main. So, Bayonne, you did that. Then we talked a little bit. You and I just yes, yes. went out and had my first apartment. And we had, um, right. Was that your first apartment? Oh. I've been home for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been home a long time, so it was well deserved. Oh, Trust yes. Me. Everybody loves their first apartment, though, right? It was nice. Yeah, it was a nice place. Actually, I lived there for a little while because um, my house burned down while we were building the the store. Uh, are you building spicing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my house in Lakeview burned down. So. Wow. <coughs> not for cooking. While I was on vacation. Uh, not from me cooking. No. <laughs> from my friend that was watching my house cooking. <laughs> 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 I was in Ireland at the time and I got a phone call. Oh, that your yeah. house had burned down? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Good shit. laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to do, you know? Uh, so you, yeah. you still got Bayonne, and then you still got so your Spice Inc. Spice yeah. Inc. was about what? What was the concept? Spice Inc. was, uh, well, started <laughs> off, people were always asking me, like, oh, you do cooking classes? And I had done some cooking classes in other, you know, other parts before starting to do that a lot, little, little retail store. And a chef deal is starting to take off now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That started kind of when I was at the bistro. That, that's, you know, the whole thing, and the, like, by the mid to late. 80s that was you know yeah so I started doing chef events and, and charity events and things around the country and um, you know meeting other chefs and, and some of my heroes and stuff so it was pretty cool um spicing cooking classes yeah so I, did, I wanted to do cooking classes. Take one of your classes maybe you know we did classes for people but, but also you know kind of one of the main reasons I wanted to do it was I thought well this would be really cool because I'll bring all these great chefs from around the country or around the world or whatever and I'll be able to learn mm -hmm. from them you know while I'm having the, you know but of course I was like working so much <laughs> that I would I would basically be at Bayana and I'd like run over and you know do the introduction and now oh, my friend taught English will you know do a class or whatever and then I'd have to go back to the restaurant <laughs> so I didn't actually get to see too many of the classes and, and I was doing a regular class myself I did a class every Tuesday night uh, on something different but I had like Mario Vitale and Todd English and Jose Andres and you know I, I had like Thai chefs and Indian chefs and that was it. It was really fun. I was really it was really cool. We had a lot of you know 
all different kinds of classes and you know hands-on classes and it was all the local of, chefs too you know and it was kind of a grocery food. store too it and it was a specialty food market and we had cheese and you know like a deli and really good imported cheeses like you know a, a great uh, selection and we did the bread uh, and we did all kinds of takeout food and you know sandwiches we made stocks and soups and all that stuff so you could buy chicken stock and veal stock and all that kind of stuff. And then we had a cafe. <laughs> we had a, a large cafe. How many square feet was that? Oh, gosh. Well, it was probably about 7,000 square feet. It's pretty large. Yeah, some of it was in the back. but So you had 500 loyal customers and you needed 1,500. <laughs> or, you know, something like that. A lot more than that. <laughs> no, we had a lot of people that came and were supportive. And I, I really did make a lot of good friends, you know. But uh, essentially, what I, what I was sort of. Uh, Telling Urban was that uh, first of all there was no parking, so that was bad, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and second of all, I just there was no real infrastructure to the to the building. It was kind of just never set up. There were so many different things we were doing, and you know the pro if we were selling like fresh produce and stuff, and if we needed some fresh produce, you know if something started to go bad, we'd use it in the kitchen or we use it in a cooking class or you know, and it was just. Kind of money was going out and coming in in a lot of different ways, and there was never any really good um, uh, accounting, you know, set up for it. Somehow, I don't know. I just don't think I ever. There was no model for it, so I didn't. I couldn't find anybody who knew how to how to set it up right. You know, nobody kind of understood. Because of the different aspects of yeah, what it Yeah, because of so much of, of stuff that was going on. So, anyway. Do you think if uh, you did it again now? You do it? No. No. Uh, I, I think retail is really very difficult. And, you know, while we were open, you know, the, you remember, I don't know if you remember Foodie's Kitchen uh, Veterans? Yeah, yeah. You know, they came and they used to walk through and, like, study what we were doing, you know, and, and it was the Brennan family, and I was friends with them, and I, you know, it was fine. They came in and checked it out, but, you know, they tried, they couldn't make it go either. You well, know, typically, that's one type of a family businesses who do that only do that those who <laughs> yeah i mean there are people i think you know part of our thing was we started too big we didn't start small and grow yeah we started off doing too many things and you know it was great it was fun uh, you know i was really fun. i was very exhausted because i literally worked seven days a week for like two years so new years <laughs> what year <laughs> new years of 1999 we opened in november of 97 and in november of 99 I just, you know, we closed, and I just didn't. It was pretty decided not to. <laughs> it was like I went down one day. I'm like, well, damn, she's gone. <laughs> well, we still, I'm gonna get a turkey sandwich or something. I, I lived in the building. Yeah, I mean, I didn't live there, but I mean, we were in the, we occupied the, the space for a while longer. While I was just trying to figure out what to do, I, and I had, I mean, not that I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for me, but my father was also dying at the time. Okay. So that didn't help. There was a lot going on. I was burned out before. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, yeah and then my dad, you know, the, it was very pretty abrupt. He got cancer, and uh, you know, went, so that was he died in February. So that was kind of going on during okay. January, and it all, you know, I just said, I think I was just tired, and, and uh, you know, so they not making that. straight. So I didn't really try to sell it, which would have been the smart thing to do in retrospect. But so I closed, and then we kept the bakery. We kept baking because we had customers at this point that we were delivering to. Let me also say, well, no one else has been able to make that space work. Yeah, it's, you know. This has never worked. Where was it? I it's in a cotton mill. Part. But the, didn't the Sunray Grill? They didn't do it. They didn't, they still not there? I mean, I thought they were still there, but maybe. I mean. Yeah, are, well, I, you know, yeah, again, parking doesn't, you know, not having parking is, is tough. It's tough having, but, yeah, although, you know, Koshan does great. Oh, yeah, that's, I don't, that's mm -hmm. Well, you know, the blockchain. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? You know, I don't know. Um, um, anyway, yes, I closed there, and uh, and then the, later the same year, we opened Herb Sing. So I wasn't giving up on the neighborhood. I really liked the neighborhood, and I really felt like it was. Herb Sing was like a, an explosion on. Mm -hmm. 
seen, I mean, I was tremendously successful. Yeah, yeah, very successful. And that was also a spot that had been unsuccessful numerous times. Um, you know, so I don't really, you know. Herb Sam was successful, you sold your interest. I saw my, well, not till like eight years later. Right. I mean, I was pretty involved in Herb Sam for, you know, quite a few years. And it just got to the point where, you know. Uh, oh, and then about a year after Herb Sam, well, I opened Herb Sam with those four partners. It was Donald and his father-in-law, right. and me and my boyfriend at the time, uh, who had done Spice Inc. with me. <coughs> and we uh, broke up about <laughs> right about a year after Herb Sam opened. So I went, I need another project. Um, so I opened uh, Cobalt in the uh, couple blocks down the street. And did yeah. that as a consultant, just as a consultant for the, for the Monaco Hotel. Um, did that for a couple of years. And they closed with the uh, when Katrina um, yeah. hit. But uh, you know, I'm, I had never been real comfortable with it. That, that that consultant thing just didn't feel that right for me. Some people love being consultants. Yeah, I don't. I'm not that good at it. I'm a hands-on kind of person. So it was it was not a, a situation that was comfortable. But it worked out well for you know what it was for for you know my purposes for me. You know, it was, uh, and uh, then I just went back to Vienna, yeah, so I don't know, then what happened after that? Oh, Katrina came around, my house flooded, uh, you know, went up to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, which is where my husband is from. Yeah, I got married in 2004, uh, and so we took the kids up, because it was the beginning of the school year, put them in school in Jackson, uh, got an apartment up there, and then I started coming splitting the week, uh, coming down from, from Jackson to New Orleans. Uh, got Bayonne uh, open in uh, November of 05. And kind of, you know, I lost my chef. He went to Portland, Oregon, and I lost, you know, a lot of different people, so it was just me. And, and um, one of my cooks, actually, both my sous chefs, a lot of my, a lot of my kitchen staff left, but I had one cook that came back that had been bugging me about being the sous chef before Katrina. I was like, guess what? Congratulations. Congratulations. So, and he did a great job. He really did. We, you know, so, so we got back open and then, you know, everything just, I'm sorry, I'm around again until the oil spill. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, before I let these students ask you some questions, we do a thing here where we do a word association. Uh -oh. So I ask you a word. <laughs> you have a uh, I, I ask you a word, and you say you know, first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Actually, a sentence, and you just answer it okay. as honestly as you possibly can. Uh, okay. You ready? I think so. All right. Call for Don. Sorry. Let's just say the first thing. The first thing. Um, uh, you know, hero. Emma Lagasse. Friend. John Desch. Funny. Burger King. McDonald's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> American fast food. Could be better. What is your favorite word? Um, for the sound or for the meaning? <laughs> Whatever one you like. Um, delicious. What is your least favorite word? Creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, laughter and what, music. What turns you off? Um, complaining. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Probably the F word. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> What noise do you love?
um, you know, made a big effort to kind of reconnect to some of the, you know, some of the, I mean, like just through the Times Picayune and stuff, like trying to find recipes that have been lost. And, and I think a lot of the chefs and restaurants realized, you know, um, that some of these traditions seem to be revived and maybe updated a little bit or revisited. And, and some, you know, uh, you know, not that you have to change it, but just, just to kind of pay attention to those things and try to make sure that they don't get lost again. So I think, you know, I, I think it's really great that there are people that are doing, um, you know, they're maintaining the traditions of the Louisiana and New Orleans food. Um, you know, I, I grew up here, but I was not totally immersed in that food because, A, because my mom, you know, cooked for us all the time. Um, and she wasn't from here, so we didn't really have roots here. But, you know, when I started working at my, that first job at the hotel, I had to cook food for the employees, and so I got taught things like how to do smothered pork chop. You know, I had a, there was a woman named Maddie McKnight, and she was gonna teach me how to cook her, you know, her food, and she taught me about, you know, smothering pork chops and doing this and doing that, all these, like, really good, you know, good local, food traditions and stuff like that. But um, I, I feel pretty good about, you know, I mean, other than the fact that people, you know, in a lot of places, you know, in a lot of the country don't really like to cook. They don't like to handle food too much. I think we have a pretty strong, you know, cooking culture down here. So I feel pretty optimistic about it. Next question. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned charity work. What charities do you work with and why? Um, I try to do as much as I can. I like I like a lot of the. Uh, I've worked a long time with a group called Share Our Strength, which is a hunger relief. They do you know national and international. They're based in D.C. Kind of a grassroots organization. What I like about them is they work hard to find ways to create wealth in addition to just you know coming up with ways to donate. They try. They're very creative and they're very you know pretty. Uh, I think they have a pretty good rating as far as, you know, how much of the money actually goes. To. When they do an event, they try to make sure that all the money goes to the, to the uh, you know, the grant recipients and things like that. Um, I also like to, you know, I really like, as I said, teaching is part of what I do. I like, I like um, working with like places like Living's Kitchen, and I just did a class with Job Corps, uh, which is, you know, teaching kind of at-risk kids, you know, trying to give them um, job skills. Not, you know, some of it, even if it's not particularly cooking, you know, that they may go out and do, it still kind of teaches them how to, you know. So, you know, how to, I mean, I, I owe a lot of my success to just being a good employee and being sort of a responsible person. And, you know, teaching that, you know, because first, to get somebody to pay attention to you and, and want to teach you and show you stuff, you know, you got to be a dependable. You got, you got. Well, first you got to show up. <laughs> yeah, that would be important. Well, you know, it's really true. 